Hi, I'm Rachel Jacobs. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist as well as a research associate at the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham. And this project took place with researchers at the Mixed Reality Lab, including an architect, um, another artist based in Brazil, Sylvia Leal, and an independent artisan programmer, Robin Shackford. So what I'm going to describe to you is some of the performative qualities of interactive mirrors. Um, and we dis we've discussed this in the paper as, as the m performative mirror space. And that's kind of trying to frame the performance space that's in front of the mirror and inside the mirror. Um, and why we did this was because we wanted to see, based on the existing literature um, and our own explorations, what um, was particularly unique about working with mirrors more than other mixed reality interactions and to see whether we can create interactive mirror experience that were a little bit more than illusionary tricks and that had some kind of meaning. So this was quite a complex artistic project, but what came out of it was some quite clear design takeaways, which hopefully I'll be able to explain to you today. So in terms of the communities that we're talking to, I think really for me, as one of the, as one of the performers and artists on the project, I was really interested in actually what this complex performance space could be and how I could design and make um, experiences that could bridge between different spaces and different mixed realities in order to create interesting narratives. And I think this, um, that some of the technical kind of understandings that we've brought together in the paper can also help other sectors who are kind of new to working with interactive mirrors and uh, reflective surfaces. The other community that this speaks to is HCI researchers who want to understand more about performance and the performance qualities of the mirror space and why mirrors have this kind of unique um, performativity. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the artistic process, which is quite complex, and then I'm going to move on to the kind of more clear takeaways. So the Invisible Project, which was the kind of key case study that took place between myself um, and the artist Sylvia Leal, based in Brazil, um, how it aimed to kind of bridge these two communities together through the mirror, and so that the mirror became a space to have conversations, share stories, and see into each other's environments and places. But alongside this, a very sort of... Um, an iterative research process took place um, in, the, in the Mixed Reality Lab, playing around with different prototypes. Um, so we then conducted a series of workshops in Nottingham and in Brazil with these prototypes that led to two public events that took place in Nottingham but that were fed in through ideas from the community in Brazil. And then we studied this using observations, interviews, um, video and photography, and analyzed the emerging themes that then led to these kind of clear design strategies. So the two public events that came from these kind of two very different prototypes involved firstly the mirror in a suitcase, which is a small intimate interaction that took part as part of a kind of wider game. So actually the interactive mirror became a prop within a larger performance. In terms of the technical kind of makeup of this, it was two mirrors, one mirror that was interactive, another one that was just a normal analog mirror. The interactive mirror was semi-transparent with a monitor behind it, kind of built into the suitcase. And then on the top was the camera that also used cell, uh, facial recognition to help kind of know when the, when the participants were near the, near the um, suitcase and looking at it. Um, and it also actually captured photos that were sent to the community in Brazil. This suitcase could move around and was much more playful. And this was kind of in response to some of the feedback from the Brazilian group that did a lot of dance and movement and were really playful and quite, sometimes quite rough with the things they were working with. The second uh, public event took place in a large, it was a large public event with 250 people. And this was a static frame 
of a mirror with multiple mirrors. The central mirror was the interactive mirror and the other four surrounding it in the cross were actually analog to just normal mirrors. So you had this kind of interesting interplay between the interactivity in the center when you looked into it and actually the reflections being different around it. Um, so I'll go into a bit more detail about which, each one. Unfortunately, this video doesn't work, but the image should give you an idea. So what happened with this is that there was a much more kind of intimate relationship with what was happening in the mirror. People, the participants moved closer to it. The, mirror, the suitcase could also move around so you, it could open up. And we used a lot of sound and instructions that appeared on the mirror in order to kind of initiate the kind of play and games that were happening as part of the bigger event. So in a way, it was very much about the interactive mirror being a prop within another performance. In contrast, and this video should hopefully work, um, this, this piece of work uh, was, had, that took place actually in a doorway and this is me kind of testing it, but what happened with um, the public event was that people kind of moved past and interacted with it as they were walking through. And there were lots of really interactions that happened where people started to do quite unexpected things with it and it's past the objects that you can see. I mean, I think you can see there that the object, the digital content appeared in the center and then uh, people kind of played with it. There were audio instructions to kind of trigger these kind of gestural movements. And at times, people actually danced with the mirror um, and passed the masks that appeared on there that came from the community in Brazil between their heads as they kind of played around. So I'll just leave you to kind of have a look at that. And that was part of the audio instructions, was asking you to fill the shape of the rock. And here, it was one of the masks from Brazil um, that people kind of played with. There were, a couple, there were some couples that actually really kind of got into kind of, kind of multiple play between the two. So now I'm going to move on to kind of more technical kind of view of what was going on. And this was actually kind of envisioned by Holger, who was the architect on the project who started to try and pin down some of the real complexities of working with this mirror space and the potential for performativity within it. So we have five different layers, which he calls panes, which, uh, where sort of interaction happens. The first one is the screen or the environment and architecture around you. So if you imagine, if I was looking in a mirror now, this projection could actually become part of the interactions with the reflection in the mirror in front of it. Then you have the equidistance pane, which is the physical space that you're in as you look in the mirror. And often we had props, masks, different elements that we could play with that also were reflected in the mirror. And I'll talk about that in a second. Then we had the actual mirror itself and the different assemblies. So with the suitcase, it was kind of less typical for this. Um, and this is quite, it's based on existing literature as well as our own explorations, which often had this kind of technical structure where there was a connect that worked with the semi-transparent mirror and then a larger screen at the back, which was the next plane at the back, which is the, uh, the screen. And then at the back of that, you have the, the wall behind the screen, which you wouldn't necessarily see, and we certainly didn't play with it, although other, other literature has shown that you know, there is an interesting space there and sometimes even puts props between the mirror and the screen um, pane. What we did do and what we were very interested in was the distance between the mirror and the screen and actually, the, as you perform and move towards the screen, often the digital content that is sort of flat and static on the screen moves through you, or rather through your reflection on the screen, which creates this really uncanny effect, often that you feel that the digital content's inside of you, which is quite interesting with the kind of rock and with the masks that sit on your face, but you can actually move through them, although it's only your reflection, obviously, that's moving through the digital content. So it's a very complex kind of set of layers. 
And what it was key for us was how these then create a performance frame, even if you're not designing for performance. So even when you're designing interactive mirrors just for things like retail or cosmetics use. So just to talk through a little bit some of the examples of this, at the top there's the frame, uh, the initial frame, the kind of prototype we did with the semi-transparent mirror and then this distance between the mirror and the screen behind that we fixed in that case. And so we had that interesting kind of equidistance between that and with between the body and how the body moved towards the mirror. Then below we have the the physical kind of space where the person was, and this was actually a workshop participant in the UK who brought a mask with him to the workshop for, to play with some narratives um, and had this uncanny experience of also having a mask on the screen and the interplay between that. The, the one below, it was the mirror, um, these multiple mirrors, and actually it shows the kind of space in front of the mirror and the, the architecture behind the, the person who's standing in front of the mirror. And then this final image brings all of this together um, so that you've got the digital content, the props, and the screen behind. So now I'm going to move on a little bit to the design strategies that came out of this and the kind of key takeaways for people who aren't necessarily working with performance but maybe want to understand a little bit more about how interactive mirrors can go beyond an illusionary trick and become and to understand a bit more about why it's a performative experience as well. So the first thing focuses on the physical context. And we discovered that the most important thing, certainly for me as an artist, was to actually design the mirrors for the space or at least build them in the space and test them there so that the physical context became as much part of it. We were aware of what was behind us. Um, and it was deeply embedded in the space. The second was the multiple mirrors and the transitions between these kind of different layers and frames. The next one was working with movement and designing for audience body movements and viewpoints to really understand what it means to have equidistance between the mirror and then the digital content and how that kind of creates a kind of sense of performance. And then to have adaptive mirrors, mirrors that can be used as props, multiple mirrors, static mirrors, and actually some of the later research was using mirrors that actually moved in response to the body movements of the person playing with it. Finally, the role of narrative, which obviously in performance is key. So this is very much about the kind of spectacle of the self and how we use narratives and stories and audio to help the interactions flow. And then finally, also, the role of narrative to suspend people's disbelief and to kind of lock into what is unique about mirrors. And I think one of the key things for me was the universal narratives about mirrors as doorways to another plane, another reality, and also as a way to kind of tell your fortune and, and kind of bring in kind of weird and bizarre stories. So for me as an artist, this was a really exciting kind of place to start to think about performance. So to conclude, I think the key thing was that actually there's kind of, was two audiences that we were speaking to. There was people like me who really wanted to understand what the performance space could be with an interactive mirror. And then these six concrete design strategies involving narrative movement and physical context for people in HCI who may be trying out different types of uses for interactive mirrors but haven't really seen and understood in the past what the performative qualities are and the potentials are for this technology. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, are there questions from the audience? So I, I would have one, um, which is if you, so this is very playful, a very playful uh, yeah. interaction with the mirror. If you look at the other extreme, um, I, I think interactive mirrors, they, they're like oh, one of the things that HCI people envision for 
decades, I think now, yeah, uh, as, as information display. So I'm just yeah. in in my bathroom. There's a mirror, like, so it could show information, which mm. is, I think, very different, right? Mm. Um, but can I, if I design for these things, do you think I can learn something from your work? I think so. I think these design strategies will help understand actually what's going on in the. In, for the person who is experiencing this, that it becomes more about a performance for them. I think in our development as human beings, the mirror is a really key point in understanding our sense of self and also how we take on roles, how the rest of the world perceives us. So we look in the mirror to see what we look like to other people often and to understand ourselves in the world. If you don't get that when you're building your mirror for information display and for cosmetic kind of you know, choice, should I do my hair like this and should I actually imagine something else through the interactive content, then you're not really understanding how people are viewing and experiencing this. So I'm, what we're trying to say is seeing uh, interactive mirrors as performance, even when they're information, is quite key. So I hope that kind of opens it up a bit. Um. Uh, hi, uh, Deepak from Swansea University. Will uh, a dynamic mirror, which can like zoom in, zoom out, elongate, shorten, interest you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly something that we were looking at and we were trying to um, build our own kind of adaptive mirror that would move as you moved and kind of respond. Um, so I think, is that something you've been developing? There is a paper done Mir in ITS 15 you could look at. Okay, yes. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Dan from Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm just curious. Uh, both cases, you mentioned that you use a mix of uh, analog mirror and also with the interactive ones. Mm. So I'm just curious, can you elaborate a little bit more on the uh, use of this mix uh, and how this also facilitates a performative or like uh, interactive experience? I think the, the, one of the key things was the, un, the ability to create an uncanny sense of what was happening with the mirrors when you could see something happening in one mirror that wasn't actually happening in the other mirror because it wasn't interactive. So you started to get this kind of weird sense of mixed reality. Um, and, uh, and I think it helped, to, I think it helps the user to also understand what the interactions are with the mirror when they can see it in contrast to a normal mirror. So we were kind of really trying to play around with these different experiences of how you're seeing yourself in the world overlaid with this digital content and this other kind of sense of another world in the mirror. Something re related I wondered about, um, I, and I mean, we see all these interactive mirrors, but uh, and, and then you even contrasted them, the, the analog yeah. and, and then the digital display. But digital, like the display works very different, right? Mm. I mean, there's the camera and the screen and it's, it's flat and if I, I mean, I don't change my viewpoint in the digital display, digital mirror as I would in an analog one. So how much does, do you have an idea how much that changes? I mean, digital mm. mirrors cannot really replace analog ones, I would guess. Well, I think they add to them, I suppose. But what we were trying to do was to see whether we could get people to play in the same way they would with a digital mirror as they would with an analog mirror. And in a way, that was partly why we framed them with analog mirrors, because it actually, there's that thing that people do in front of interactive displays, whether they're mirrors or not, where they stand and they wait for something to happen, or they wait to wave their arms around to see what will happen. And we wanted this to be a bit more natural and a bit more fluid, so it wasn't just waiting for the trick, and it actually really became an experience that unfolded and that people felt more natural, and they were taken unawares in some ways, so that you could spook them out and have a proper theatrical experience rather than that, come on then, show me your tricks. And so I think we were really trying to play around with that and see whether you could add that to the, the digital mirror, I suppose. Okay, cool. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.